Chances are that at some point in your life, you have used that overused cliche, stuck between a rock and a hard place. We've all been in a place where there's no good option to go forward with. You have to labor between two or maybe three or maybe 10 different options, and you find that none of them are very great. You have to pick the option with the smallest opportunity of negative consequences. When we are in those kind of situations, isn't it nice when something comes along that sort of provides direction? Even if you're a decisive person, these situations can give us pause on how to move forward. But sometimes, you just have to put your head down and go and hope for the best, right? These aren't exactly the, the greatest situations, but often you can look back on these types of circumstances and see that you grew through them. It stretched you a little. And in the best of circumstances, God used what you were experiencing to help you to trust less in yourself and more in his providential provision for you. So as we land in Genesis 32 today, we're finding that Jacob is literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because if you will remember back to the passage that we explored last week, Jacob and Laban actually used rocks as markers for the covenant of peace that they were making as Jacob was leaving Laban's care. There were rocks there. They were literally used as a marker. And we know the story. Jacob was tired of getting deceived by Laban and having his wages continually changed. This whole departure from Laban was a long time coming. And we felt a general tension in the story of Jacob ever since Laban craftily schemed to have Jacob marry Leah instead of Rachel after Jacob had worked seven long years for the hand of Laban's younger daughter. And so Jacob left Laban without letting his father-in-law know, and Laban was unhappy, and we remember from last week, he tracked him down. And what happened? God intervened. He warned Laban in a dream not to do anything good or bad to Jacob. And this whole situation was resolved with these stones I was talking about. They were placed as a reminder not only of the covenant between Laban and Jacob, but it did something else. It acted as a physical dividing line of where Laban and Jacob could go. Laban from the east could only come as far west as these stones. Jacob could only go as far east as these stones. And so what we have seen with this is that Jacob has to move forward. God has ordained it to pass that Jacob must press on. He must continue west. Even if he wanted to return to the east and to that area around Haran, he can't. Those rocks act as a divider of where he can go. He must press on to the land that God has promised to him and to his offspring. Despite, despite his desire to avoid the uncomfortable situation with his brother, Jacob must face Esau, and he must trust that God will protect him from the threats that have been made against him. And so, we are getting deeper into the drama of the life of Jacob, right? It's, it's ramping up once again. And so we're going to break down these verses that we've read today into three main points so that we can better navigate with the end goal of pulling truth from them and applying it to our lives. So our first point today is we find that Jacob is afraid of Esau. Even though God has given him proof of his protection and provision, he still is dealing with the fear that his actions have caused. We find that he fears this retaliation from Esau so much that he divides his family into two camps to protect half of what he has. The second thing we're going to see is that Jacob cries out to God. He is clearly filled with fear because we actually see him putting it all on the line with God in a way that we've never really seen with Jacob before. As he pleads for help, he recalls the promises that God has made to multiply his offspring, and so we feel the deep sense of concern that he has, not only for himself, but for his wives and for his children. Finally, 
we find that Jacob sends out a gift for Esau. Jacob does not go with the servants and the livestock, but he sits back and he waits to see how it will be received. There, there is a substantial amount of fear in Jacob, even though he has the promise of God. And our passage for this week leaves us hanging as we come to the end of it. Will Jacob's fear be realized? Or will God bring a peace between Jacob and Esau that we never would have imagined was possible when we started hearing about all this tension between the two of them? And so we start out this passage and our first point for today, and we see something interesting. God sends angels to Jacob as he is starting out after the covenant with Laban. Now this is really interesting because Jacob has had this happen before, right? When he was leaving the promised land, he encountered angels back there at Bethel. He was leaving the land of promise, and now he is returning, and he's encountering angels again. Isn't that interesting? As he departs the promised land, he encounters angels. As he comes back, he encounters angels. And so it basically frames his time in the land in the east with Laban. And so he's welcomed back to the land, and it's a reminder for us that the hand of God is upon Jacob. And most importantly, it's a reminder for him. He's welcomed back to the land. Now remember the message that he received when he left the land, that message at Bethel. The blessing of God wasn't just for Isaac and Abraham. This blessing was now being extended to Jacob. And this is a reminder of that truth as Jacob faces arguably the biggest obstacle in his life thus far. He has come up against a lot in his life. But the threat of Esau is that, is that little threat, that tension in the story that's always hanging there. No matter what was going on with Laban, we're sort of reminded Esau wants to kill him. No matter what's going on in his life, we've remembered this part of it. And you have to wonder, is this the way Jacob thought? Was this threat of retribution from his brother always in his mind, always just hanging there like it is in the story? Well, no matter what was going on, he has to go back. We've seen that. He's between a rock and a hard place. He cannot go back to the east. And so this meeting with the angels here is a gracious act from God. He was told that, that God would be with him when he left the land, and now he is reminded that God is with him as he comes back to the land. In the midst of the anxiety that would have been an ever-present reality in his life, God graciously grants Jacob a reminder that he loves him, that he cares for him, that he will be his protection. And so Jacob makes this place a base of operations as he prepares to meet Esau. And we can see what he does here. He sends out messengers in front of him to see what the situation is going to be here. He isn't about to just run into his brother without knowing what he's up against. He has to know that, that with the influence of Isaac, Esau must have servants galore and wealth that Jacob can't match. And so planning to overtake Esau just isn't a reality. And so he sends out these, these servants to check out the situation, but these aren't just spies that are to sneak a peek at Esau's encampments and then run back and report the situation to Jacob. They are sent to Esau with a message. And what happens? Jacob declares that he is Esau's servant. Now, this is an interesting statement for us. Jacob is the one who is blessed, right? He is the child of the promise. He has the protection of Almighty God. His father Isaac blessed him. How is he Esau's servant? He is a servant of the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac. But he is now cowering at the thought of encountering a mere human. He has the favor of God, but now he is seeking the favor of men. But this isn't going to be resolved by his own power. Like so many of the other events we've seen in Jacob's life, God is going to have to win the victory for him, and God gives him a very clear reminder of this truth. Because a report, a report comes back to Jacob that confirms his fears. We discover that it isn't just Jacob that is expecting to run into Esau. It turns out that Esau is coming to meet him. And this isn't good news. 
This isn't running into a friend you haven't seen in a while in the food cart at the mall and say, hey, let's have lunch together. That's not what's going on here. Esau is looking for him, and he has a significant force with him. Like I said, this isn't having lunch with an old friend. This is like the school bully seeking you out to take your lunch money. And he has a gang of cronies to give him a hand. The information we receive with Esau coming after him with a significant group of men is to let us know that Jacob is overmatched. That's the point here in the text. We are to understand Jacob is overmatched. That's the story. I always, I always tell a story about when I was younger. Back when I was in high school, we still played Brandon Valley in football. And I would tell people that I always knew when we were beat. It wasn't late in the fourth quarter or even at the half that I knew we were beat. It was when their team got off the bus and over 100 kids walked in front of us. That's when we were beat. Our little ragtag group of 50 or so was no match for that. We knew it was over when that happened. You know when you're beaten, right? Jacob had to have looked at the idea of 400 men and said, I don't have any hope here. They are many. Esau is many. I am few. I don't have a chance. And Jacob was essentially beaten when he heard about these 400 men. And look at what happens. He goes from verse 2 where he's all excited and he declares that he is in God's camp to being greatly afraid and distressed in verse 7. In just five verses, we see a complete change in attitude. And he quickly develops a plan on how to limit his damages. And I'm guessing your thoughts on this little plan are probably similar to my thoughts here as you think about this, this plan. What are you doing, Jacob? How are you going to do this? How are you going to divide things into halves here? One wife to camp one, the other to camp two. Joseph with Rachel and the other kids born by Rachel's servant. And then Leah with the other. But, but she has more kids, so we can't divide it exactly in half. So maybe we'll send some of the children of, of, of Leah with Aunt Rachel. What, how do you do this? How do you make a decision on how to do this? And we understand here, as you think about the absurdity of it all, this is an unbelievable situation to put your family into. Imagine what must be going through their, through their heads. Imagine how this is taking Jacob's distress and fear, and now it's being amplified to his family. Imagine what this was like as they were dividing up. Imagine being the family and the servants and, and Rachel and Leah. What are we doing? The whole thing helps us understand just how dire the situation is. And so think about where the deceit of Jacob has led him. It was 20 years ago. 20 years ago that he deceived Isaac to receive this blessing. But now this sin, that was 20 years ago, has him figuring out how to divide his family so that only half of them will be overtaken if Esau attacks. Look where this leads. Now, I've been, I've been spinning this in a negative way, but you can understand why he's doing it. He wants to preserve as much of his family as possible, and he fears for their lives. He fears for his life. But there's one thing that he isn't fully doing in this. He's not fully trusting God. But something does come from all of this angst, from all this uncertainty. In the midst of his fear, he is turning to God. We can see that he is going to. And we see his prayer as we move on to our second point, and we see him cry out to God. And he cries out in, a, in such an amazing way because he appeals to the faithfulness of God. He calls God the God of his father Abraham and his father Isaac. God has been faithful to his family and he acknowledges that faithfulness in this prayer. He knows the story of how God was faithful to protect Abraham and how God confirmed his faithfulness in Isaac. And so he cries out to God in hopes that he will be merciful to him like he has been to his father and to his grandfather. And he should know that he will be faithful because he isn't hearing the promise of God second or third hand, is he? This promise of God on him isn't something that he heard from his grandfather Abraham. It isn't something he's heard from his father Isaac. 
God himself has spoken to him and told him to return to his home country and says that he will be with them and he will protect him. So does he think that God is sending him into this trap? Now, it's a trap of Jacob's own design, right? Jacob caused this, but, but God is going to be faithful to protect him just as he has been so far. And we can see this in the way that Jacob makes his plea to God for mercy. What does he do? He acknowledges that he is not worthy of the steadfast love and faithfulness that God has shown to him. Now, this is quite the confession from Jacob, isn't it? He is acknowledging that he hasn't been faithful to God, even though God has been faithful to him. He doesn't deserve any of it, but yet he cries out for God to protect him because it's the only hope that he's got. He needs God to intervene. And you and I can understand this because when we think about our state of affairs, we understand that God is our only hope too. We are not mildly misguided and in need of redirection. In our sin, we are not sick and in need of some medication to get some things sorted out. The Word of God makes it very clear that we are dead. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We need an intervention just as much as Jacob does here. We need Almighty God to intervene and resurrect us and bring us to newness of life because it's the only hope we've got. We need God to intervene just as badly as Jacob needs intervention in this story. And so we can pray right along with Jacob, I am not worthy of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. That's not just Jacob's prayer, that's our prayer. Ultimately, we acknowledge that here every week when we confess our sins, right? We're not worthy of the mercy that we have been shown. And yet God, in his steadfast love, continually shows us mercy. And so that's why we continually cry out to him, even though we know we don't deserve it. And that's what Jacob is doing here. He calls out to God to protect his family, and he invokes the promise that God has made to him. God, you said you would do good to me and make my offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered. And so I'm going to trust you, God that you will protect my offspring, even though it seems as though this situation is impossible. I'm going to believe your promises because you're the only hope I've got. And so we have seen these cries of Jacob. And we move on to our final point for this morning as we see Jacob send out a gift for Esau in hopes that it will bring peace. And you know what the goal of this is. He's hoping to appease Esau. Now, I don't know how things worked in the ancient Near East on matters like this, and I'm sure you don't either. But doesn't this whole thing feel a little bit kind of off to you? I mean, I get wanting to offer a peace offering, but, but after what Jacob did in deceiving their father and taking the blessing, does it really feel like a few hundred goats and sheep and camels and donkeys are going to make things better? Esau has 400 guys with him. He clearly has wealth. He has power of his own. A few hundred head of livestock probably won't make a bit much of a difference in the life of Esau. He has livestock. He has wealth. He has power. You would think that what he really wants is vengeance, right? I mean, don't you think that's how it would work? But in looking into this a little deeper, it actually would have seemed that this was an extravagant gift. This would have been a enormous amount of a gift given to Esau from Jacob. That's a lot, of can, a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep, a lot of goats, 550 animals in total. So we have to think about this a little bit. Why would Jacob do this? Well, he's not only afraid, but it would seem that he also understands that he's wronged his brother and that Esau has every right to enact justice upon him for what he's done. And so this gift lets us know that Jacob knows he's wrong. Just as he acknowledged before God that he wasn't worthy of steadfast love and mercy, he is acknowledging before Esau that he has wronged him. But we find that Jacob isn't putting too much hope in this gift, even though it is a substantial gift. Once again, acknowledging the severity of his actions towards his brother. There's an acknowledgement that what he has done 
may not be fixed with a bunch of animals, and so he prepares to protect everyone. And he instructs his servants to speak to Esau and let him know that he is coming. And notice how he once again tells them every time, refer to me as Esau's servant. Jacob is doing everything to let Esau know that he sees him as the superior one. The gift indicates that, and now he's telling them to refer to him as the servant of his older brother. It's not just the gift, it's how he is seen as a servant. And notice what we have here again. We have an acknowledgement that Jacob is between a rock and a hard place. He has to go forward. Laban is behind him. Esau is in front of him. As much fear as he has, his circumstances are forcing him to trust God. He's going to find out whether or not God will protect him and whether the gift that he has sent to Esau will appease him. And as we conclude with this last part of the passage, there isn't much resolution in what we've read today, is there? We're left hanging. What's going to happen? Jacob can't go backwards. He can't go east. There's a dividing line. And then he has an obstacle in front of him. Life has been a struggle for Jacob from the get-go. He has been wrestling with conflict for his entire life. And now we are left wondering here as we leave the story today, what's next? And we're going to find that God is going to once again show his faithfulness to Jacob and that he is going to keep his promises. Now, but that's a story for next week. And it's a story for the ages, this Jacob wrestling with God. It's a story for the ages. But before we move on to that story, we have to deal with this one. How can we apply this passage to our lives? Well, there's one specific thing that I want us to think about today. As I've alluded to many times, Jacob is between a rock and a hard place. He's filled with fear because he had adversity and potential conflict on every side. And in that position, he cries out to God and acknowledges how much he needs him. In the face of fear, Jacob knows that the Lord his God is his only true source of peace. As the world around him is closing in, he cries out to the one who has promised to keep him safe and to make his offspring like the sands of the seashore. He trusts that the one who can truly bring him peace will do so because he has spoken and he believes that word. It's hard for Jacob, no doubt, but he trusts it. And he brings the promise of God up because he knows the one who has made the promise is faithful. In the face of fear, he believes that God can bring about peace. As we face the times in our lives when we are overcome with fear, we must remember the God who has spoken the word of promise to us. He has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He has promised that when we are in him, we have the sure and certain promise of eternal life. He has promised that our sins are forgiven. He has promised that we have the perfect righteousness of Christ. This is true, not because of anything that we have done, but because Christ suffered and died to satisfy the wrath of God for our sin. And he rose again in victory over sin, death, and hell. These are promises that God has spoken for his people in his word. And so when we face the fears of this life, we can have peace because the promise that he has given us has been spoken and fulfilled and has been kept in the Lord Jesus. Now this goes, this applies to the macro problems that we see in the world. It also goes to the individual problems and fears that you and I face in our daily lives. Not only is God in control and working all things together for good for those who love him, but we know, we know that the Holy Spirit indwells us. And we can have peace regardless of the circumstances that are going to come at us this week. But just as it was for Jacob, this is hard. It isn't easy to trust God, but like Jacob, it is important that we remember that Jesus is all we've got. Without him, we have nothing 
because he is the one who will deliver us. But the best part of all this is that like Jacob, we are his covenant people. We have a covenant promise from God. And so he is going to hold on to us, and he will give us peace, because that is what God has accomplished for his people. And so, may we not be a people of fear, but instead, may we be a people of God who rest in the peace that God's salvation brings to us. Amen.